first of all, how do you define democracy? Because we know for the past many years, it's been defined by the Western world. So what's your definition of democracy? Well, uh, the very term democracy is used everywhere, yet its uh, definition is uh, controversial. If you ask a typical, uh, say, guy in the West, he's likely to say, well, it's a multi-party system. It's a one person, one vote, universal suffrage. I would describe this kind of uh, definition as procedural democracy. Uh, the Chinese one is more sophisticated. We would call our democracy as people's democracy. But today we even see whole process people's democracy, which will be a combination of not only procedural democracy, but also substantive democracy. This matter of substance is important. That is, what kind of purpose democracy should serve and what kind of objectives democracy should achieve. So this is where China, I think, excels. The Chinese model excels. Yeah. You just mentioned like China's whole process, people's democracy. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, it means... Um, uh, Again, let's uh, compare the Chinese model and the Western model of democracy. I described already the Western model is essentially procedural democracy. Or as uh, <laughs> a French uh, thinker, Rousseau, uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, described uh, the, the, the Western, Westminster democracy, British style, as a one-day democracy. That is by time of election. Once you have an election every four years, on that particular day of election, you have democracy. After that, you don't have democracy. So the Chinese, what, what we call is a whole process democracy, in contrast to Western, what I call limited process of democracy. That's the key difference. I can give you some examples. For instance, what we call the democratic lawmaking, how to make a legislation. In the case of China, when we promulgate a law and or an act, in the first place, we will send this very first draft of this act or this law to the grassroots. We have hundreds of, or even more, depending on your definition, what we call the legislative reach out offices. For instance, in Shanghai, there is uh, several of this kind of offices. Uh, you will send this draft to these offices, and these uh, outreach offices will contact ordinary people to have their feedback, their reactions. I'll give you an example. When China adopted its um, uh, uh, law against uh, family uh, violence, and uh, uh, the first draft came to the Shanghai office, and they presented this to the ordinary people, they received all kinds of feedbacks one feedback, which was uh, in the end incorporated into the this very particular law, is that in the original text there was only reference to um, uh, husband uh, violence against wives. Then in the new law there is this uh, the violence by the young against the elderly. That also occurred in many uh, circumstances. So this uh, new element which was the, brought into the law. In other words. In the very process, from the very beginning of the lawmaking, you have a really involvement of the people. Then you have the discussion by the professional uh, uh, legislators and then adopted by the National People's Congress. And they also have the supervision of this law, to what extent it has been implemented. They have all kinds of mechanisms to supervise and to, to see whether this law has been implemented and also can be revised according to the changing situations. Same with uh, uh, what we call the democratic decision-making. In the case of China, we all talk about the rise of China. It had to do with China's long-term planning. We have a five-year plan. Every five years, we have a major plan for economic and social development. This very process of uh, this uh, five-year plan, and it's very making, again, from the very beginning to the middle, to the very end, and to its implementation, to its supervision. You have a whole process. For instance, normally it takes at least one year and a half to draft 
this five-year plan. It involves thousands of rounds of all kinds of consultation with different think tanks, ordinary people, internet democracy, solicit opinion from the people, and at various levels of People's Congress. In the end, you reach consensus, then, adopt at the, then to be adopted at the National People's Congress. Then each every, what we call two sessions, the session of People's Congress, the session of the Political Consultative Conference, the Chinese leaders will report to the deputies to what extent they will implement this five-year plan and also national uh, one-year plan and even longer plans. Mm-hmm. It's already a very sophisticated process. Same with the election of leaders, uh, the what called democratic, democratic process of choosing leaders. Uh, if the Western model is called the uh, election, the Chinese model would be called selection plus election. If you look at the criteria for the top echelon of Chinese leaders, say the uh, member of political bureau of the party central committee or standing committee, uh, in most cases, these leaders have been working on the grassroots at different levels of Chinese government hierarchy for decades. Mm-hmm. So usually they have governed more than, say, 100 million people before they come to the current position. So extremely competent, highly selective. And so I call this selective selection plus election. It's uh, by far a better model than simply relying on election. We're very Mm. proud of this. As you said, unlike the West's democracy, where now there's the West liberal democracy, Mm. China has chosen to explore this unique style of democracy and now we call it a socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics, um, which has been developed based on its national context after numerous trials. And then could you give us some more backgrounds about um, how China got to where it is today through following this socialist democratic system? Well, you know, in the case of the uh, People's Republic of China, uh, you must know it's a product of uh, over 20 years of uh, uh, armed struggle led by the Chinese Communist Party. So PRC was created by the uh, Chinese Communist Party. And uh, in the process of this armed struggle, mainly it is um, uh, relying on the organization and mobilization of the Chinese peasants at that time representing more than 70, more than 95% of Chinese population. So they were mobilized, they were organized into peasants associations. They were the really foundation of the Chinese People's Liberation Army and the Red Army. So through this kind of what we call the democratic mobilization, in the end, the results in the founding of the People's Republic of China. So you have these genes with uh, uh, support of the people. That's important. Uh, since the founding of the People's Republic, especially in the first, what we call the first three decades, and when China was under the leadership of Chairman Mao, and uh, we achieved a lot, especially the first stage of industrialization. Uh, yet we copied a lot from the Soviet model. That model has its both positive side and negative side. On the positive side, we achieved a first stage of industrialization. On the negative side, it was excessively bureaucratic. So Chairman Mao said that that system, that kind of model, uh, should be changed. So he launched the Cultural Revolution. Yet uh, a, a, land, uh, a Cultural Revolution was a bit chaotic, you know. Uh, basically, the grassroots party institutions were more or less put aside, if not abolished. Uh, as a result, in the end, you know, the whole situation uh, was somehow out of control. So since the reform started uh, in 1978, we began to rethink the whole issue of democracy. So we start this process today, we officially called three-pronged uh, democracy. We have a leadership of the party, and we have the rule of law, and we have the people as the master of the country. Yeah. As you said, Professor Zhang, um, people's democracy in China consists three parts, um, uh, party's leadership, 
uh, the people as the master of the country and the rule of law. Could you please ex elaborate more on that? How does people's democracy or China's consultative democracy work in the country? Uh, essentially, you know, um, when we talk about the leadership of the party or the Communist Party of China, we have to have, first of all, have a basic understanding of the CPC. It is called a party, but it's not a Western-style political party. I would describe the Chinese political party, CPC, as a holistic interest party. And behind this is China's long tradition. You know, China was first unified uh, in 221 BC, so over 2,000 years ago. And uh, since then, China was more or less under the leadership of a kind of unified ruling entity, always like this. I call China as a civilizational state because one of very few civilizations which has been continuous for thousands of years to today, same with this tradition for political governance. And um, in other words, if you compare CPC with Western political parties, CPC would be holistic interest party, which started from the Chinese tradition of unified ruling entity. Otherwise, it could not govern a civilizational state, which is amalgamation of hundreds of states into one of its long history. Yeah, And uh, the Western political party, I would describe them as partial interest political parties or partisan parties. I think most Westerners will also agree. So then you see the difference. When you have a leadership of a unified political entity, which represent the overall and holistic interest of people, then you can plan for the future. You can carry out reforms because if you want to carry out reforms, you need to overcome vested interests, which Chinese Communist Party can do. Western parties and interests have great difficulty to do that. Mm -hmm. Same with planning. We can plan for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and into the next century, you know, 100 years. So that's really the strength of the Chinese political system. You need to have a political force that represents the interests of vast majority of population China has now. Then rule of law, that's something we learned from the Cultural Revolution. When you abandon the rule of law, then the country became chaotic. So we have to follow the relevant laws in China, have an orderly democratic process. Otherwise, uh, a country of 1.4 billion people will be chaotic. Mm -hmm. With this kind of accord, two guarantees, they achieve the purpose of people as the master of the country. In other words, through the process of, uh, I said, whole process of democracy, you from people to the people, to the people from people, many rounds of consultations and all kinds of uh, uh, processes, in the end you deliver. The system ends up in delivering to the people. Behind this Chinese culture, uh, focusing on people's livelihood. So whatever you do, uh, political policy, economic, economic policy, social policy, foreign policy, it must all boil down to tangible benefits for the society, for the people, not only for Chinese and even for other peoples. So we are a socialist country. I think this is a real democracy. In the West, increasingly, you see democracy has become what I call monetocracy. And with the uh, involvement of money, involvement of social media, uh, there is a runaway populism. I think the Western system now faces far more challenges than the Chinese one. Yeah, actually, in one of your previous speeches, um, you compared China's socialist democracy with the Western de democracy from three dimensions by using um, uh, former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln's um, uh, phrase of the people, by the people, for the people. And you said China's socialist democracy indeed outperforms American democracy in many ways. And on top of that, um, you said actually you bring you bring you brought it up many times in our um, previous conversation. You said China's democracy built on the basis of from the people to the people. Um, then what's um, so what's the relations between 
nowadays the good governance and democracy because you also said like a lot of people nowadays consider good governance instead of political、uh, system political structure of the country as a way to assess if the country has democracy or not so what's your take on yeah, that this is a position i advanced、uh, Decades ago, and I said,、um, as democracy, the term has been understood and、uh, interpreted in the West as a multi-party system and universal suffrage, or as I said, procedural democracy. And as Chinese claim that our democracy is called the people's democracy, so the two sides cannot reach consensus. Then can we have a meaningful discussion on the issue of democracy? I said, now let's borrow this very concept from Abraham Lincoln, of the people, by the people, for the people.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you look at the two model, Chinese and American, we are doing much better than the American model. In terms of for the people, you look at the progress China has made. Literally, you know, living standard of ordinary Chinese have increased at least twenty fold over the past four decades. By comparison with most Americans, you know their income stagnated for over three decades. Today, China's average life expectancy is already higher than United States. China is seventy-eight, United States seventy-six. So, for the people, China has done better in this category. In terms of of the people, if you look at the structure of the Chinese civil servants. Uh, at least ninety percent come from ordinary background rather than from the rich. This is very different from the American model. The American model is uh, uh, as uh, uh, the famous uh, scholar uh, Stiglitz said: uh, "It's of the one percent by one percent for the one percent."、Mm-hmm. I think maybe half of the Americans would also agree to that. I look at the opinion surveys by the PW early this year. Seventy-two percent Americans don't think、uh, their model of democracy is a good model for others. No, that model is in trouble. As for by the people, that's most controversial. As I said just now, if the Western believe、uh, simply procedural democracy means democracy. If you're happy with that model, congratulations! Congratulations! You can continue with that model. We don't envy you. We think that a procedural democracy, as democracy itself, is a, a really the problem of your system. It has to be reformed. Otherwise, the West will really decline and decline more sharply than ever before because the system is sick, is really in deep trouble, profound trouble, in crisis. Yeah, and.、Uh, As I said, you know, things、uh, more or less, especially in the Western media, democracy simply means uh, 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 procedural democracy. And then the Western also advocate this、um, whole、uh, paradigm called democracies versus autocracy. So you put China into the category of autocracy. I think it's very stupid, and very ignorant and stupid. And、uh, well, how can I、uh, describe it? It's、uh, so out of touch with what's going on in China, and、uh, so I said, long time ago, let's have a paradigm shift from so-called、uh, democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. The good governments may take the form of Western political system, and good governments can also take the form of other political system. The Chinese one is one of them.、Yeah. Same with bad governments. So this is a paradigm shift. I'm glad, you know, it's uh, increasingly uh, accepted by more and more people,、uh, including those in the West. In other words, whatever political system, multi-party system, one-party system, no-party system, it all should end up in de- delivering to the people in good governance. And let's compete on to what extent your system can do, can deliver better governance. That's crucial. Nowadays, in the Western world, they consider holding elections or voting as the way to show that they have democracy. However, we we know China has produced much economic growth. It has lifted over eight hundred million people out of poverty. It has 
saved millions of lives from COVID pandemic and improved people's living standards dramatically. And, uh, and also it's important to know that China, Chinese people have the right to vote as well. So despite all of this, the West still has a hard time to accept that China has a democratic system. So what's your understanding of this? Like, what's your take on this attitude from the West? Why it is so difficult for the Western countries to understand that China has a different version of democracy than that of the West? Uh, in the first place, you know, China is a civilizational state. Whatever China uh, is doing or has done or will do in the future, it is uh, entirely independent of the Western whatever directions. Uh, on the part of the West, I think in her, it's really the time for the West to uh, really examine its own problems of its political system. This whole idea of procedural democracy means democracy is in deep trouble. And I often say, you know, the Western political system, democracy has three, I may even call genetic flaws. The first is the very presumption that human beings are rational. So this kind of rational human being assumption is faulty. And second is this uh, rice I absolute rights, in, from Chinese mind, rights and obligations must be matched. Otherwise, a modern society cannot run and cannot function normally. And the three, procedures are all that important. If procedures are correct, everything is okay. We think all these three uh, uh, defects are the problems with Western political system, fundamental problems. Unless they work on that, improve that, to change that, Otherwise, the system cannot last very long. That's my prediction, and my political prediction, my prediction often turn out to be right. And um, so, uh, I think first of the Western should uh, reflect on their problems, and uh, they should have courage to look at the Chinese democratic model, uh, really uh, honestly and uh, courageously, uh, rather than. Uh, living in their uh, comfort zone as if uh, their system is a better system. No, that system is not working. I know the West very well. And uh, so let's, if they prefer, I think two systems can compete with each other. And I think the Chinese system uh, is doing better. I said this a long time ago, you know, both systems have their share of problems, but the Chinese model and Chinese system function at least up to now, uh, better, much better than the American system. Yeah. Do you think the Western world, they, they don't really know about uh, what's they going on here in China? They, they're very ignorant and very uh, arrogant and ignorant. It's very look at Western media. So sometimes I said, we have already explained to you once, twice, three times. So we really fed up with this rubbish in your media. You know? So we don't care. We leave you in darkness. We don't care. You know? I see. And, and lastly, um, Professor Zhang, um, we know the scholar Francis Fukuyama, he said um, the last decade has seen a democratic recession. Um, but he said part of that is because Russia and China have been trying to project their influence beyond their borders, and that's hurting the interest of glo global democracy. That's according to him. However, in the meantime, some scholar pointed out that what the West has is the liberal democracy and their demo uh, democracy is losing substance, as you also mentioned, due to the fact that it's designed to keep a small capitalist elite in power while giving the outward appearance of being a rule like of the people, for the people and by the people by election. Um, so what's your observation on this? What's the real reason behind declining liberal democracy in the West? Well, first, let's come to uh, Professor Fukuyama, uh, the author of The End of History. Mm. And uh, you may know uh, we had a debate uh, in the year 2011, so 23 years ago. And um, I said to him, you know, your system, American model, uh, is in deep trouble. I say you need to have substantial political reforms. Otherwise, you're going to elect a leader worse off than George W. Bush. And many people today say your forecast turned out to be right. 
And he also, uh, along with his uh, end of uh, history thesis, at that time predicted China could also have Arab Spring. At that time, it just occurred in, in Egypt as an Arab country. I said, mm -hmm. no chance that the Arab Spring will become Arab Winter, and then it became Arab Winter. When he uh, mentioned this uh, whole idea of um, uh, end of history, and from that he uh, projected that uh, China would also have uh, Arab Spring, uh, because at the time Arab Spring occurred in Egypt and many other Arab countries, I said no chance. I said the Arab Spring will become Arab Winter. In the end, it became Arab Winter. So basically, the whole process, whole whole presumption of um, End of history is is deeply faulty, and uh, as I said, the China is a civilizational state today. Russia also claims itself to be a civilizational state. India also say we are a civilizational state. So all these countries now say no to the American model, and to the American or Western imposition of their so-called universal values on. Um, these countries. So it's so normal because we are really from age of the civilizations. And for thousands of years, we are pow more powerful, more prosperous, better governed country than European states. So that's crucial. You know, uh, then we have learned a lot from other countries, from the West, but we also learn a lot from China's own traditions, from our own civilizations. So we become civilizational states, both super modern and also with age old civilizations. That makes the Chinese case uh, very impressive. So we can really look at the American model and ponder your problems, your defects, where you are going wrong. And so we have to teach you a bit about how to run a better political system, how to govern the country better.